Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. I am Natalie Harrison, and I'm the Global Fund Specialist for Momentum Investments, and I have the great privilege of working with the UK-based investment team at Momentum Global Investment Management. And today, I have the great privilege of having three great panelists um, joining us today, all the way from overseas. So two of my team members, Gregoire Sharma, one of our portfolio managers, who's joined us last year, really, to look after our global fixed income capability, alongside Alex Harvey, and then Richard Statley, one of our other portfolio managers who really looks after a lot of our asset allocation portfolios for the South African market. And then we've also got Adrian Petrianu from Ashmore Group, our guest speaker, who's joining us all the way from Asia. It's nine o'clock there, so we're really privileged to have him joining us today. And he's going to be giving great insight into what's been going on in the Chinese property bond market. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you straight over to Richard, which is going to be giving a bit of a dipstick into what's going on in global asset classes, as well as our overview, and as well as a view of what we're thinking and where we're positioning our portfolios. So over to you, Richard. Okay, and thank you very much, Nat. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. I'll name to talk for about 20 minutes and then bring in my colleague, Greg. And Adrian, Adrian, thanks again for joining us. Uh, as you can all no doubt imagine, uh, a lot of this presentation from the material in it, I considered throwing away after Thursday last week when things changed. Uh, but what we'll delve into is the extent to which things have really changed following news of this bankruptcy of Silicon Valley Bank uh, on Friday last week. Uh, for those who want to drop off now, I can tell you that things have changed a little bit, um, but it's not the end of the world. That really is going to be the punchline in your start for time. Right, moving on quickly. Now, uh, I don't think this is stepping back too far by going all the way back and looking at global growth projections, i.e. by zooming out too far. I don't think I am. Remember um, that growth is a key determinant of the environment in which our investees operate, be they companies, be they indeed governments. So I do think growth is important. What you have on this chart in dark red, that is history of global real year-on-year -year GDP growth going back to the 60s in dotted red, which hope you can see towards the right-hand side. That's looking forward. And those are World Bank projections for where growth is going to be uh, in 2023 and 2024. And, and the punchline is, is that we're looking at a couple of years of sub hard growth going forward. Uh, the dark blue line is full period average. The, uh, the other two lines are moving averages. And anyway, the point is the dotted red line, those are the projections from the Technocrats, the World Bank, and they are slightly beneath those longer term averages. So the World Bank thinks we're heading for a slight, slightly subpar period, we don't disagree with them. So bear in mind that we're all by and large aware that we could be in for a, a slightly tough couple of years. Nothing drastic, not like a 5% decline in real GDP like we saw during the GFC, but nonetheless a little bit tougher. The other key big headline economic variable here I am, unashamedly focusing on the US, but it it is inflation, it drove markets last year, it's going to continue to be the key factor this year, we think. And, and this is a very similar construct, this chart you've got in dark red, you've got the history of US core inflation, um, it's headline inflation actually going back to the 1950s. Um, and then you've got the projection this time coming from treasury markets, i.e. what are treasury markets expect by way of inflation and hence what is priced in with respect to the difference in yield between nominal treasuries and those that are inflation protected. And the takeaway here is that inflation is obviously expected to come down. You see the dotted red line coming down. Nonetheless, it's expected for the next few years to end up in a range that is somewhat above the, uh, the averages we got used to in that post GFC era when inflation was that much more benign. Uh, again, when we look at this path discounted by markets, we think. Uh, that looks broadly sensible. So add those two things together, kind of subpar growth, slightly higher than normal inflation, but inflation not running out of control. That's the kind of context that we think we're probably in. 
Now, we're always very interested in economic variables, but much more interesting clearly is what is going on in terms of asset prices. I'm going to turn to those in a bit. Anyway, we don't need to get bogged down in the detail of what this chart is showing you. The red line, this is basically a composite index, picking up a lot of key asset price relationships, relationships between traditionally defensive assets and more risk-seeking assets. And, and this we call a risk aversion index. We're always interested when this index is at extremes. Um, if it's very high on this scale, then that means markets are very fearful. If it's low, then vice versa. And the takeaway here is that I've described the kind of economic outcomes we think we're in for. Uh, what is the market expecting and, and you know, how fearful or calm is the market? Well, it's been, it's been very relaxed, actually, bordering on complacent. This line is well below its long-term average. So there's some complacency out there, there certainly was before we got into Thursday last week. And so you add that together, don't worry about reading all of this chart, just focus on the box in the middle at the bottom. What we've felt is that we do need to be cautious in the short term. Uh, we're going to look for periods of weakness to add to risk assets. Um, uh, and that's where we were coming into, as I say, this, uh, this bankruptcy last week. It has thankfully served as rents. Well, the question then is to what extent have all of these projections and expectations changed on the basis of last week? So what did happen last week, just to catch everyone up? Well, on Tuesday, Wednesday, there starts to be rumblings about Silicon Bank needing to raise cash very fast to pay out depositors. Then on Thursday, they crystallized a very significant loss by selling treasuries that have been carried on the balance sheet of par. They had sellers in the market. They realized the big loss. And it became very apparent that there wasn't enough by way of assets in the company to cover their liabilities, which is deposited cash. Um, some useful stats now from Deutsche Bank, just contextualize what's going on here. Uh, there wasn't just the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank last week. We had two others, so three uh, failures. Um, however, uh, I quote here from Deutsche Bank, there have been 562 failures since 2001. So yes, we've had three failures in a week, but there have been 562 over the course of the last 20 years. So, um, you know, the first point, three bank failures, that's bad. The second point, bank failures do happen in the US. That kind of counteracts that. Um, next point from Deutsche Bank, the average deposit level of banks that have failed, those 562, it was 0.4 billion. Uh, in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, it was 175 billion. So clearly a much bigger than average failure. That is uh, unequivocally a very bad point then. But equally, let's balance that by putting 175 billion in context of the 23 trillion US economy. Well, US economy, in terms of what it produces year on year, um, Silicon Valley Bank, assuming all of that money disappeared, which of course it hasn't, not in any way. Um, you know, there may be a haircut. Um, there already has been to equity holders, but, you know, um, some of that money's gone, but certainly not all of it. Even if all of it had gone, the 175 billion I just quoted, well, that would take 0.8% of US GDP. So that's a bit like your employer turning around to you and saying, in my case, Richard, we're going to take 0.8% of your salary. Now, I'm not going to be pleased, but I think that's probably something that I would get over. So look, all of this is just meant to try and help contextualize what happened last week. Uh, the key question, uh, I think anyway, you can ask us others at the end, is are we looking at another banking crisis? Uh, and therein, uh, I would say simply that uh, Silicon Valley Bank does look like a special case, both in terms of its assets. It got that all wrong. It didn't have enough floating rate assets, there was a fixed rate. And as we saw last year, didn't want to be at fixed rate because interest rates moving up. Uh, and then also on the uh, liability side, their deposits, all their deposits are linked to a single sector, being the tech sector, which is burning cash because no one wants to lend them any money. Uh, and also they're, you know, the businesses that need cash, the investment ramp up stage. Uh, uh, and also um, 
uh, on that side in terms of their depositors, businesses tend to move much quicker um, than individuals do. Um, so they respond to higher interest rates, they move their money. And so the bank was seeing withdrawals in short and on the asset side, they got it all wrong. They didn't have enough floating rate and debt, as I say, to pass on these interest rate rises. So it was a special case. Give you some numbers on that. Silicon Valley Bank had greater than 50% of its assets in long maturity fixed rate debt, predominantly treasuries. Uh, most banks would have the order of 25%. So they, they really had gone and bought far too much duration. It did look different. Uh, as a rule, rising interest rates tend to actually help banks net net. Uh, it helps them more on the asset side than it hurts them on the liability side. Um, so Silicon Valley Bank looked different. And then also adding to that, the Federal Reserve has come out with a pretty big statement uh, to say that you know, they're going to protect all uh, uninsured depositors. So on that basis, um, you know, I, I don't think it looks maybe that, that material. Um, going back to where I started from, remember, we already know that we're heading for a year of you know, some hard growth. Well, this has only reinforced that, surely. We uh, already knew that we're heading into a period of slightly sticky inflation. We've just had the CPI print at 12.30 London time. That's confirmed that core CPI in the US hasn't come down as much as expected. Uh, That's the month on month print. Um, so again, we already, we already knew that. So has anything really changed? Um, well, I think, I think it has to an extent. This is unequivocally a bad thing. Bank failures are bad. Um, they're bad for um, equity investors have been wiped out. They're bad potentially for some of the bank's customers, although as I say, the Federal Reserve has set out, said it's going to protect them. There's the risk of contagion. And, and then finally, you add on to that, there's just animal spirits. When people read about bank, clo about bank closures, they're more likely to go and pull money out of their existing bank, look to switch it into a, a higher quality, bigger bank like a JP Morgan or a Wells Fargo. So it just introduces these kind of frictions. So it's, it's unequivocally bad. Uh, it means we're surely closer to the peak in interest rates of this cycle. With more and more things are breaking. We've had the US housing market slow down considerably, and now we're seeing uh, over levered entities start to break. So it is bad. The market reaction, I would say, has actually been reasonably measured with the exception uh, of bond yields, which I think uh, went down too much. Uh, they've overreacted to this news. Uh, and indeed, we're seeing them start to reverse. The two year Treasury yield is up 25 basis points uh, just today. Uh, and that's when I looked about 15 minutes ago. So adding it all together, I think I posed the question, is this the end of the world? This is it's not the end of the world, not in, in our view. Uh, we do think Silicon Valley Bank looks somewhat different. Is it, is it bad for that outlook? Yes, it is. As I say, it brings us closer to uh, a recession. Um, but do bear in mind, as I said at the outset, that a lot of that information about a recession, about subpar growth, and about sticky inflation all of that is known, so it is not a big change. So I've gone on for a bit there about Silicon Valley Bank. I hope it was reasonably clear in terms of our views. And do ask me any questions if you still have any. Right, I need to race a bit now because I think I've got seven minutes that I'm going to hand over. Here is that market reaction just quickly. This was up to Friday's close. We saw the banks fall more yesterday. We saw um, equities in the US actually fairly stable. We saw government bonds add a bit. But anyway, it's a pretty typical risk-off reaction with safe havens like government bonds and indeed gold doing very well. Uh, and then more economic sensitive assets doing worse. Uh, in terms of that, banks uh, down 7% then, down in excess of 10% over the last few days. Um, I think some of the higher quality banks like JP Morgan, I think that starts to look interesting. Uh, in terms of some of the smaller regional banks in the US that have been heavily penalized, with well, some of those, quite frankly, are going to go bust. So I'll be quite careful there, uh, is my insight there. Uh, from our side, just quickly on the portfolios, we don't own as many government bonds on the left hand side as we what would like to as you enter this kind of period, but we do own quite a bit of gold. So that has certainly helped. Uh, we do have some private equity exposure, and uh, I was probably wasn't clear enough. The Silicon Valley Bank supported a lot of PE companies and their investors, so that's definitely an area we've spent some time scrutinising. 
observations are one, our private equity exposure is small, and two, uh, our private equity company's exposure to SBB is vanishingly small. So we're we're pretty relaxed there. So overall, we do continue to look line by line through the portfolios. But I've said that I don't think it's the end of the world, and I can tell you that it's not the end of the world by any means for our portfolios. What do we think uh, in terms of asset classes? Uh, you can see the main asset class at the top there, equities, fixed income, alternatives, and cash. Uh, and we think there's you know, quite a lot of reasonable pricing, certainly the fixed income complex and the rates complex, that has improved materially. We still like alternative diversifiers, though, um, like esoteric areas, which we think are overlooked. Uh, you dig in the second table here to equities. What do we like? We like the UK, we like Japan. We're less comfortable with valuations in the US. Uh, if you want to understand why, you have to bear with me and look at a very densely populated chart. It's actually simpler than you think. If you just focus on the two line charts at the top, what they're telling you in terms of the left hand one is telling you the return on equity in the UK market looks depressed. That's the red line below the horizontal blue line. The blue line is where we think it should be, the red line is where it is. So currently, today, buying companies. It's prospects for profit, we think is going to eventually be on the up. On the right hand side, what are you paying for those same companies? Well, you're paying very much a par amount that's shown by the train P being in line with a kind of fair level again using the horizontal blue line. So you're buying something at a normal price, but it's something that we think is going to be more valuable going forward as profitability increases. This is the lens we look at all the regions from, and this is why. We like the UK. Going back to the dashboard, we've now moved on, and it looks the same. We've moved on to fixed income and to specialist assets. And if you know it's a bit hard to see, but there is a change column, and you see that we've been upgrading government bonds and index linked government bonds, and we've been downgrading credit. Uh, so we're going to look into why that is. Uh, you'll see we like emerging market debt, that top table. And then finally, when you move on to specialist assets, it's an area we still particularly like. Uh, we are pretty happy with our property and infrastructure exposure. We're pretty excited about specialist financial right down there at the bottom. So again, quickly, a few details on that. In terms of why do we increase like government bonds? Well, here are the local currency yields on offer in various areas. You can see there when this chart was created, it, you know, in the United States, you could get a 10 year yield of 3.93%. You could only make 0.5% in Japan, and you can see that four rows up, five rows up from the bottom. But always remember you've got to convert things into a common, common currency. So, why don't we hedge things into dollar and also look at the shape of the yield curve? You can earn something by way of roll down. And anyway, when you make those adjustments, which simply put is just hedging a Japanese bond in to dollars, you'll see that actually your yield goes up to 5.17 cents. So with these kind of yields on offer, I think it's no surprise that we have been increasingly happy with our bond exposure. In terms of taking a little bit of money out for IG and high yield, uh, there's again a lot on this chart. The key point is in each instance, you're looking at a spread, which is additional compensation you earn going into these slightly risky credits. Uh, that's in the blue line. You want that blue line to be above its average. Uh, that would mean you're getting extra compensation than you normally do as we sit here today on the verge of a tougher economic scenario. You can see that not many of those blue lines are above the average. Uh, interesting that in Asia they are, and uh, that will segue me to Adrian shortly. Uh, just finishing off on my section, uh, we do like property, global REITs. See the dividend yields on the left hand chart here in line with their longer term average. On the right hand chart, you can see that if you go to the public markets to buy a REIT, you're buying the underlying assets pretty cheaply relative to their NAVs. Now, I do think the NAVs are going to come down, uh, but nonetheless, there's a nice cushion there when you buy some global listed property. That's why we have it still in the portfolios. The area I said we were quite uh, happy with that we liked was uh, specialist financials, so just some specialist areas of the fixed income markets. Um, at the top there, we like EM local sovereign debt. We could get a double boost from local rates in EM coming down ahead of parts of DM. 
but also from ENFX outperforming. Uh, we like subordinated bank and insurance debt, particularly in Europe. So things like contingent convertible bonds or COCOs, we think there's some mispricing going on there. We've spoken about what's going on in the banking sector, but remember I did say, we still think the bigger banks look in good shape, hence we'd be happy to lend to them selectively. Finally, the bottom there, securitized lending. Uh, again, um, areas that tend to be uh, slightly less well understood. So asset-backed securities, uh, uh, bonds that are backed by residential mortgages, these kind of things. And that leads me on neatly then to one other areas uh, that we think is esoteric and poorly understood, uh, that being uh, EM Asia high yield debt. We own the Ashmore, it says there at the top, Ashmore EM Asia high yield debt fund in our portfolios. Uh, in that fund, among other themes, is significant exposure to China, the Chinese real estate sector, uh, much of which is already in default. Uh, we can, in fact, make money in these situations, but Adrian would do a much better job than me of describing that. So anyway, I'm delighted to have Adrian here. Thank you for coming on, particularly given the hour. Uh, Adrian is going to be, I think, give a presentation first, but we're then in conversation with Greg, we'll put some questions to him, and just by way of brief background, Adrian joined Ashmore in 2013, I believe, from UBS Investment Bank, and he is a portfolio manager for emerging markets for the debt. Uh, with that, Adrian, I hope you can hear us, and over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me on your um, kind of conference presentation. Um, very happy to talk to you from from here, from Asia, um, about um, kind of our um, expertise and the opportunity that we are seeing in emerging market uh, that in uh, Asian high yield bonds. Let me start sharing the presentation. So I hope that you can uh, see the presentation now. So taking from what Richard was saying before, we are in times that we are seeing a bit more volatility than usual in the um, debt and equity markets. And one thing that the default of the um, kind of um, Silicon Valley Bank brought to the market is apart from the kind of volatility and all the mayhem, it's actually brought some clarity as to the end point of the hiking cycle. And we now there's still some speculation whether we're going to get 25 basis points hike or nothing in uh, at the end of, uh, of March. But this is it. Pretty much we're done with the hiking cycle. And, and that's a very interesting point because this is when the markets are kind of starting to think about a possible recession and the yield curve starts to, to steepen and especially the bonds in the front end are starting to, to rally. So this is quite a good time to look at fixed income um, asset class, but quite selectively. And what we propose to you here is to look at what is probably the most beaten up part of the um, fixed income uh, and corporate credit asset class. Traditionally, in times of crisis, it makes sense to either buy the kind of super safe haven assets, which as you've seen, hasn't really worked that well for people that bought safe haven assets, but with long duration. So you have to be careful what you're buying, even in the safe haven part of the market, or go to the other end of the spectrum and invest in the most beaten up part of the asset class. Now, what has happened over the past two years in the Chinese real estate market is really the biggest correction that we had in emerging market history. This is bigger than what we've seen in the financial crisis, uh, especially because it's happening in Asia, which is really the most 
cash rich and savings rich part of uh, emerging markets. Now, um, I will go very briefly over the timeline of this crisis. It really started in mid 2020 when the Chinese government decided to actually deflate a little bit what seemed at that point as a kind of um, potential property market bubble by focusing on companies which were highly levered. And they introduced a set of tightening rules called the free red lines, which were targeting specifically these highly levered companies. This was a very small share of the overall Chinese property developers universe. And these were companies that have grown very aggressively and took a lot of that. And the intention was to give them two years to be able to reduce the leverage. Unfortunately, at the same time, in what has transpired over the next two years to be quite a heavy-handed approach, the government instructed also the banks to lend less to the property developers and also to lend less to the mortgage market, to the people that were using leverage to buy into those property. Initially, it seemed that all was working fine, and that the companies were going to be able to deliver, which would bring an asset class with much more sustainable credit dynamics. But then all of that has blown up in August 2021, when the companies have presented their numbers for the first half of 2021. And we've seen that even though the companies were able to deliver according to the specifications of the government, which were to pay down bonds and bank loans. They were paying those down by accumulating trade liabilities and defaulting to their suppliers. And that has transpired in uh, the numbers of some of the most levered companies, uh, companies like Evergrande, Caissa, names that by now you are familiar, which over the following several months, they have gone into default. And we had a series of default, about 10 large issuers uh, defaulting in 2021. Still at that point, it looked like this was a problem for a niche of the market. The investment grade rated developers were still doing quite fine. So it was about five or six of these highly levered companies that were in trouble. And the market and everyone was expecting 2022 to be a year of recovery. Unfortunately, 2022 proved to be a much more difficult year because as the time when all the countries were opening up their economies and were moving on from the COVID um, lockdowns, China went back up. And we had major lockdowns in China. We had a very significant slowdown in the economy the lack of liquidity in the property sector became more acute um, as investors and buyers of property were facing problems getting mortgages. Also, the consumer confidence of these investors started to decline, and we have had an increased number of defaults. Because China has a Communist Party Congress that only happens every five years, this is an extremely important event for the political class. And nobody wants to really come in the spotlight ahead of these events and be seen as either not doing enough or being too active because then your position kind of becomes attractive for other uh, government officials that might want to get ahead in the party. So the combination of the slowdown happening right ahead of this very important political event and the fact that the political class was pretty much like the proverbial rabbit in the headlight, not wanting to do anything, prolonged this crisis and led to a systemic crisis. We had default rates of close to 70%. Not sure in the next slide how big this crisis became in 2022. Um, really what has happened a small, badly managed uh, effort by the government to deflate a presumed property market bubble 
has resulted in the biggest um, sectorial default that we've seen in emerging markets, with 70% of the 100 plus developers in China uh, going in default between 2021 and 2022. Just to get a visual uh, representation, you can see that in the period from 2015 to 2020, we had four issuers defaulting for just about $3 billion. In 2021, we had about $44 billion of default, which ballooned to about $50 billion in 2022, with 56 issuers going in default over uh, this uh, period. So a massive uh, increase in default rate at that, uh, at that point. Now, what has happened after the Communist Party Congress? Um, after the Communist Party Congress, we really have seen the government changing direction 180 degrees. Uh, first, we've seen a very strong set of policies being announced in support of the property sector. And these come from two directions. One, from the PBOC and the um, banking regulation, the CBRC, um, in the form of a 16-point directive aimed at the banking system, giving instruction to the banks, which are also state banks, with very clear instruction, like all loans coming due over the next six months get automatically extended by one year telling bank staff that they will not be held responsible for NPLs that might result from these new loans. And ultimately telling the banks that none of these loans extensions will be considered as non-performing loans and will not require additional capital to be put aside by the banks. Now, I've been in emerging markets for nearly 25 years. I've never seen a regulator being so kind of plain in telling the banks, you have to lend to this sector. And then the government went to the Financial Markets Association, uh, NAFMI, and announced the free arrow policy, which is aiming with three arrows of support for the property sector. The first arrow, it's aimed at access of the property developers to loans from the banking system. Uh, with capital being put by the central bank to ensure that the banks can lend to the sector. The second arrow deals with access to the bond market. And there the uh, government has put guarantees in place, allowing some of these developers where the bonds were trading at yields of 20, 25% to borrow basically at government rates at around four, four and a half uh, percent. And lastly, they open up the access for property developers to the equity market. The third arrow is about access to equity market, which, by the way, has been closed for six years. Property companies have not been allowed to raise equity in the Chinese A-share uh, market, again, to stop the sector from growing uh, too fast. So they've really gone 180 degree to support the sector. Now, if that was not enough, you also had in November the announcement that finally China is reopening. And that brings a boost of consumer spending, a boost of sentiment, but most importantly, about the equivalent of $2 trillion in savings accumulating in the banking system from people not spending money during the period of the pandemic. Now, the impact from all these measures saw a significant repricing in credit spreads, where you see here, we went from a crazy average of spreads above 6,000 basis points to press spreads coming down only to about 2,000 basis points. It's still the cheapest sector by far in the index, but we have experienced a significant tightening. Now, just to put this into a longer term perspective, you can see on this slide the performance of the China real estate part of the market versus the corporate debt index. And you can see how China has outperformed the index over more than a decade. Now, in two years, we've underperformed by 
more than 50%. Now, we have had a correction. We have had some repricing, but there is still a lot of room for this sector to come back as we are going to enjoy uh, stronger growth in Asia. Um, I know we were going before over the growth numbers for the overall world economy showing a slowdown in growth, but that masks the fact that developed markets are actually going to see a significant decrease in growth this year, while emerging markets are actually going to see an increase in growth in both 2023 and 2024. And this is largely driven by Asia. Chinese reopening is going to be helping China, but actually the highest growth country in Asia and in emerging markets is India at the moment. We also expect strong growth in Thailand, Vietnam, other countries that will also be strongly benefiting from the reopening of, uh, of China. Now, you might think that after this significant market rally, um, you've kind of missed the trade. Uh, that's absolutely not the case. And just have a look at this slide, which shows you the proportion of bonds in the Chinese real estate high yield market trading at distressed prices. Yes, we reached completely crazy levels in October when over 80% of the bonds in the Chinese high yield property sector were trading below 20 cents. Uh, now the market has recovered. We still have over 40% of the bonds trading below 20 cents, but nearly 80% of the bonds are now trading below 40 cents. Uh, typical recovery in emerging market corporate debt is around 35 to 45 cents in the situation of, uh, of default. So this is what you get out of the debt restructuring before you start to see the recovery in, um, in the market. We've constructed a portfolio that really is focused on these defaulted bonds and bonds in distress. So the bonds that have not defaulted but are still trading at levels uh, around kind of 50 cents and, uh, and lower, which we believe are the areas where we are going to get the biggest bang for our buck in terms of uh, recovery. But also here at Ashmore, we just we not just kind of buy those bonds and kind of hope for the best. We are also taking a very active approach to managing these restructurings. Um, we have about 30% of the portfolio in uh, 14 companies which are in default. We are currently on the restructuring committee for seven of these situations. And we are hiring the lawyers, we are hiring the financial advisors, we are negotiating with the companies to put in place a comprehensive debt restructuring, which basically gives the companies two to three years of runway with very limited debt payments um, and with ability for them to use any cash flow that they generate to buy back bonds and deliver. So they will be able to come up on the other side with a stronger financial position and ultimately benefit from what we believe it's going to be a strong reopening in this, um, in, in this sector. The, that restructuring is that we are working on are predominantly focused on debt maturity reprofiling, on lowering coupon and changing coupons, uh, normal cash coupons for payment in kind coupons, but we're trying as much as possible to avoid equitization of debt. We're going into these situations as debt investors, uh, and we want to come out on the other side as um, that investor. So this will predominantly remain at that fund. We might be getting some equity into those companies uh, for free part of the restructuring. Um, we'll not be force seller of these. We don't have to force the uh, sell the, the equity. We can hold to the equity for a while, as long as we believe that is in the best uh, interest of uh, investors. But we will not be buying equity in this fund. This is a debt fund. 
we're buying distressed bonds and we are turning around those bonds and uh, pushing for kind of significant uh, upside from the um, recovery. I wanted to say that the fund is about 70% invested in China and China real estate. It's the biggest part of the fund. We have on average price of our China holdings about 25 cents to the dollar. Although not all of these bonds are in default. We have exposure to 24 credits um, with about 10 of these credits being on the run. So companies which are paying and they're not in default, average price for this part of the portfolio, it's 48 cents. And then we have 40 companies which are in default where the average price is 15 cents. Again, for these, even a kind of normal recovery scenario where Ashmore is not involved, we not have the ability to drive a better deal, is typically 35 to 45 uh, cents. We believe that we can achieve uh, recovery values in excess of 50 cents. We have delivered uh, two debt restructuring so far this quarter alone. Um, one in a company called China Fortune Land and another one in a company called Fantasia. Um, these are the China Fortune Land. Already the new bonds have settled. In the case of Fantasia, this will be happening towards the end of the month. And we're working uh, really hard on other situations, including um, for large restructurings like Evergrande, we are on the kind of creditors committee and we're working on this uh, restructuring and we're very optimistic that we are going to get um, um, a, a good solution um, there. So that's basically what we are doing. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and thank you for the opportunity of being um, here to present. I will kind of hand it uh, back to you guys to um, ask any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Adrian. Very insightful uh, indeed. Um, I, I prepared a list of, of questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on, on two questions in particular, if, if that's okay. Um, the, the first one is, is um, we, we've seen the rally stalling in, in February, um, and I was wondering if you could quickly touch on, on the reasons behind that, uh, focusing on, on China real estate, and where do, we, do you think we, we go from there? Sure. No, that, that's a very good point. Um, I mean, look, we, we had three months of very, very strong gains. Basically, from November to January, we had the value in these bonds have pretty much doubled. Now, after such a rally, it's normal to have a bit of profit taking. And we had about a 7% uh, pullback in the, in the strategy. What the markets are always focusing on the next event, the next trigger. The next trigger is the property sales. This is what everybody is focusing on because you can have the government putting liquidity into the system. You can have us as bondholders helping the companies extend the maturity profile and in essence, buying them time. But ultimately you need to have the property sales picking up. You need to see the companies going and buying land, which is usually a good indicator that the developers are bullish on the outlook for the market. Um, January was a little bit complicated as a month for sale. We get reports for month for month uh, sales because the Chinese New Year has impacted January. It came at the um, end of January uh, this year, and that's a slow uh, week. It's basically 10 days that get uh, lost for property sales. Yet in February, we, we literally just two days ago seen the numbers for property sales. And I'm really happy to say that after 20 months of negative month on month growth, this February is the first month that we are seeing some uh, improvement in sales. Now, these improvements are first showing off in the 
tier one cities and some of the tier two cities. It, it's clear that in the tier one cities, you have wealthier um, investors, people that accumulated more cash during the pandemic. So it's normal that you see um, the first stages of the recovery happening there. Also, the banks are more comfortable lending to people in the tier one cities. They have more secure incomes, more secure job. So again, that's the place where we were expecting to see the first green shots, if you want, of the recovery. And indeed, uh, in February, we've just seen this basically for the February month, which was reported uh, to the two days ago. So I think we are now starting to see what I believe for the next several months is going to be the driver of sentiment in this market, namely the, the recovery in the property sales. Now, it's not going to be a straight line. So that's um, that's clear. I mean, after such a massive correction, um, it is going to be volatile. Uh, but the combination of financial support, improvement in consumer confidence, higher property sales, and what we hope it's going to be a stream of successful debt restructurings, which are going to be announced, are going to provide the momentum for the next leg in this uh, rally. Our expectations for the returns in these strategies are potentially to double the value of the fund once again uh, by the end of this year. So this is a massive opportunity. Um, I, I, it will be crazy for me to tell you that this is going to come smooth with no volatility. I mean, you don't get this type of returns without some risks and some, some volatility. But I think it's a highly idiosyncratic play. It's not correlated with what the treasuries are doing. It's not correlated with what the S&P is doing. It's very, very cheap levels that you are buying those bonds. And you still have a level of income that comes from the 70% of the portfolio, which is not in default, which provides you a carry, which is in excess of double digits. I mean, typically when you're buying distressed bonds, you, you have to wait for a few years, you're getting zero income, and it's just the hope that you're going to make some capital appreciation at the end. And you're paying very significant fees for that. This is a fund which has no performance fee, very reasonable management fees, and you're getting an income in excess of 10%. Well, if we are indeed correct about the size of the opportunity and the size of the recovery, you can double the value of your investment. Well, thank you. You, you clearly paint a, a, a very attractive investment case here for, for the asset class. Um, my, my second question, therefore, is um, you know, what, what indeed needs to happen for, 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 uh, for a more structural support of, of the asset class? And, and I guess tied into that, what are the main risks that are keeping you up at night, that, that, you know, that you are mostly concerned about? Sure. So there isn't a huge amount of new things that the government needs to do. As I was making the point before, they already have come with a massive package of support for the sector. Basically, they need to maintain these um, lines that they put in place for the state banks, and maintain the pressure on the banking system, which is a state banking system, to continue to lead, uh, to lend to the sector, and at the same time, not stay in the way of the restructuring that are going to happen. Because you're going to have a number of restructurings, some pretty big ones like Evergrande, they will have to go through the local courts. So the government will have to facilitate and not complicate the process unnecessary, which I think they will be doing because there's also a lot of local money at stake. Uh, the dollar bonds represent just about 10% of the liabilities of this sector. So the restructuring of this sector is really about saving the kind of Chinese banks and Chinese insurance companies that have a huge amount of money at stake in these uh, in these exposure, they are not kind of doing it for us. They are doing it to save 
basically first their, their own investors, and very importantly, to restore confidence in what is a sector that generates about 20% of the GDP of, uh, of China. Now, in terms of the threats and the risks, um, you have kind of the, the usual ones, which is um, risk of policy mismanage. We, we got into where we are right now because of heavy-handed policy uh, by the government. Um, I believe to some extent that's mitigated by the fact that you have an entirely new government team, uh, which basically everyone from President Xi downwards has been replaced and has a new five-year mandate. So the incentive set for them is to really do well over the next five years so they get reelected for the next. This is their first mandate. They all want to have a second mandate. And they're also going, only going to get the second mandate if they do well in this, um, in, in, in this period. Also, the, the property developers are really the main funders for the local government. Local governments over the past 10 years have been raising funds by selling land to the property developers. And these land uh, purchases by private and state-owned companies are a very important source of funding at local government level. So as a Chinese government official in the province, you need to have money to keep the people happy, to build stadiums and sport facilities and all, and all that. And for that, you need strong developers. So really the interests are very much aligned with um, with, with, with the government. Now, there is also very often mentioned the risk of kind of conflict in Taiwan. Um, obviously, that's uh, very much a tail risk. Uh, I don't think you can construct a portfolio for such a risk. It, it, is, it is there. It, it always um, exists there. It's why you have to have diversification in um, in your portfolios. But I would say that after the experience that Russia had with the very strong response by the Western world, uh, very powerful sanctions, including the confiscation of the reserves of the central bank, and also the fact that a military that, unlike China's military, had actually had a little bit of kind of actual war experience has performed so badly faced with the Western trained military. China on paper has a very strong army, but they haven't fought a war in 50 years. And when the bullets start flying, you, you really have to have people that know how to kind of handle uh, war. And I think China has taken a lot of notes from what's been happening in Ukraine. And I think, if anything, a potential conflict in um, Taiwan has been put back at least a few years. Right. China is not ready for the type of sanctions that Russia faced, and especially China is much more integrated into the Western economy. It will take years for them to uh, insulate themselves and get ready for such a situation. So I'm, that's one of the risks that I feel more comfortable now, given what's, what's happening in, in Russia with Ukraine. Great. That, thanks for the comprehensive answers. Um, with that, I'm going to pass over back to uh, Natalie, uh, and, uh, and I'll thank you, Adrian. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian and Gregoire and Richard. Adrian, I've actually just got a question from one of our attendees. So the, the Chinese real estate is obviously full of huge varied qualities in terms of issuers. How is the Ashmore Fund positioned to take advantage of supposed opportunity sets in the various sectors? Sure. So that, that's very correct. I mean, there are a lot of uh, companies in the Chinese property sector. There are over 100 of these companies. Um, how we look at them, we kind of split them in three different categories. We have the companies which are in default and are trading at very distressed prices, typically 30 cents to 10 cents or even below. 
Then we have the companies which are stressed. They gone through a difficult period, but they have managed to avoid default. Sometimes tapping into the pockets of the owners, getting loans from state banks, but they managed to not get in default. But the bonds are still very much stressed and they are trading from kind of 35, 40 to 60 cents levels. And then you have the companies which are actually very strong. 90% um, of those will be the state-owned property developers where the crisis kind of barely touched them. And they are trading at kind of prices around 85 to 95. Now, we believe that if you're going to get into the China property uh, sector, you need to focus on the first two categories. There's no point buying bonds at close to par um, at this moment and kind of being paid seven, eight percent uh, yields. So our portfolio is roughly split half and half in terms of exposure between the distressed one and the stressed one. In the stressed ones, we're a bit more concentrated. We have about 10 names because we believe that most of these companies have the potential to go back to par. Basically, if they survive without defaulting over the past two years, chances are that they are going to do well. Also, if you're not in default, you have better access to liquidity coming from the facilities that the government has put in place. On the distress parts, when the bonds are trading at very, very low prices, then it is a little bit of an educated guess. Clearly, some of these companies are not going to survive on the other side. We have 14 of these companies, and when we choose them among the over 60, which are in this situation, we look at the quality of the land bank, whether they are focusing on richer regions and they have kind of better land compared to being somewhere in the middle of China where you have uh, less valuable land. The uh, connections and the relation that the management and the owners of the company has with the local government. I mean, this is communist China. These are very, very important relation in terms of being supported by the state banks and getting access to financing. And ultimately, we are involved with about half of these in active negotiations. And all the time we can assess, are those kind of negotiating in good faith or in bad faith? And if we feel that they are not really negotiating in good faith or their requests are outrageous, we can quickly move to, to other companies. As a matter of fact, we, we hope and our plan is to, as we restructure some of these companies and exit the bonds at hopefully double the valuation where they are now, to be able to roll back the capital and start again with other companies that maybe have been slower in restructuring. It takes a lot of effort and the local resources to manage one of these debt restructurings. We probably have the largest legal team for an asset manager that is focused on emerging markets. We have 16 lawyers that are working alongside the portfolio manager team on managing that restructurings. And also we have hired external legal counsel for each one of these restructuring, external financial counsels. So there's a lot of effort that's going into managing those situations. But if we can get even a 20% better outcome because of our involvement, that really adds value to um, to the fund. Awesome, thanks, Adrian. I think it's been very insightful just hearing about this unique opportunity set, and obviously you built a great investment case, and it's a big reason why we do use your guys, I suppose, fund within our fixed income bucket within our multi-asset portfolios. So thank you so much for your time, Adrian. It's been a great pleasure to have you especially since you're in Asia. So it's quite a big time difference. And of course, thank you to my team in the UK for joining me every every month when we host these things. But what we're going to do is we're going to sign off. So thank you for your time. We will be sending a thank you email with a copy of both Richard's presentation as well as Adrian's, as well as a copy of the recording in case you missed any of it. Thank you for your time. And with that, I'm going to sign off. Thanks, okay. everyone.